Thank you, future bride. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's all stand up. Uh, I am a little bit concerned about this message, a message this morning because I because Lord, I haven't done this in church in all the 40 years that I've been in the ministry, and uh, this will be the first time. So uh, I don't know if you have notes because we're going to just, just go dive deep into the Scripture. Uh, are you ready to go through the whole book of Revelations in 15 minutes? <laughs> That's what we're going to do. Because last week, we talked about why is Jesus coming? What is the most important reason why? What is the motivation behind the Lord? I mean, he, he died on the cross. He paid for our sins. So why all this end of time issue? And I, I, I went through the motions of trying to make us understand that it's not a horror story. It's a love story. That the Lord is coming back for us. And the reason is because he misses us and he loves us. And I told you that from the very beginning, the uh, book of Genesis, uh, the first two chapters and the last two chapters in the book of Revelation, we see how God's going to do a reset in the whole of the heavens and the earth. So if you haven't heard the message, I suggest you go to our YouTube page and, and try to listen to it one more time so you can be refreshed, no? Okay. Now, we're going to talk about some things that can be controversial uh, or have been uh, a point of discussion in many of the body of Christ, in the, many of the churches throughout the years. And uh, I, I will not espouse a particular stand, but I'm going to try to give you a clear understanding so that when you go home, if just in case the rapture happens and you get left behind, you will know what to do. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> But then you will know exactly what is really going to happen, okay? Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can be students of your word. It's so important for us, Lord, as you have spoken in your word, that these are words of encouragement, though sometimes it can be scary, but we know you're, you're saying it, you've written it down to encourage us. So we keep it in our hearts, Lord, and open our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before you sit down, sit to the person next to you. He is coming. He is coming. Okay. Okay. I had a chance to stand at the Mount of Olives and where exactly, supposedly, where Jesus left the earth talking to his disciples. And siempre, nandun kami with a group of other tourists. We were just wondering, Lord, are you really going to come back here? And then there are many references that you can find out because at the Mount of Olives, you're overlooking the old city of Jerusalem, and right in front of you is the Golden Gate, which if you read in the book of Ezekiel, the Messiah is going to come through the Golden Gate. So, so much surreal, the time that we... You, I, I, I try to take it all in my spirit. Now, one of these days, I'm going to take a, a group of uh, members of our Jesus flock to go to Jerusalem, and we're going to see exactly where the Bible has uh, happened, you know. And uh, so this is a very serious message, and uh, um, uh, I'm sorry if I'm going to take it too seriously, but before I become too serious, I'm going to say a joke. Is that okay? Okay, that's, that's good enough warning <laughs> for everybody. There were two churches that's across from each other, and uh, so warning, this is a funny joke. <laughs> now, both of them have signs in front of their churches. One sign says, turn yourself around before it's too late. And the other church has a sign in his front yard that says, the end is near. So this guy driving down the street, you know, he's an agnostic, and he's just so offended by the signs, so he rolled down his window it says, oh, you religious freaks, you're crazy, nothing is going to happen, you know, so he screeched on the street and turned left. As he turns left, there was a strong screeching sound and a splash of water. Now, one of the pastors said to each other, maybe we should have just put the bridges out. 
Uh, that's funny to me. I won't say no. <laughs> anyway, it can mean a lot of things, right? Revelation, the word apocalypsis in Greek. If we get the word apocalypse uh, in uh, English, it means revelation, means unveiling or revealing. And uh, I always say the book of Revelation is a revelation to John, but it's all confusing to us. No, sa kanya lang revelation. And then one of the disciples, John, got exiled in a rock quarry in Patmos, and he sees this whole revelation, and he wrote it down, I believe, at the age of 90 years old. In fact, the Bible says, history says, they actually wrote the book of Revelation first before he wrote the Gospel of John. Now think about what he wrote. And this was written to the churches during that time and for our time. Chapter 1 Jesus shows up in a glorified form. And uh, you know, he hang, up, hang out with Jesus for three years. He knew exactly how Jesus looked like. But when Jesus appeared to him, it was different. His hair is white as wool. He had uh, you know, a white garment and his feet are like bronze. And there's a sword coming out of his mouth. In fact, John was so shocked, he was slain in the spirit as if he was dead. Then you go to chapter 2. And chapter 22, all the chapters of Revelation are seven major events that are going to take place. I'm going to try to make it as clear as possible for everybody to understand. At the end of the message, I'm going to mention the parable that Jesus says about the second coming. And then we're going to close, all right? So, 20 chapters about seven events that are going to take place. The first event is when we have chapters 2 and 3. I believe we I discussed that for seven weeks a couple of months ago, the message to the seven churches. And this is what we would call the church age, where all of us exist today. And so, uh, you know, you need to go back to all the messages. I think the first two chapters is a preparation of the church for the second coming. Then, amazingly, in chapter four, I would say it's the rapture of the church. In Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Now, what is a rapture? I discussed that last week. You know, and let me read it first in Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing in heaven, and a voice I had heard, first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. And once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with one, someone sitting on it. Literally at that point, now I want you to take note, look at me. At that point, the word church is never mentioned again in the book of Revelation. It was mentioned 60, 18 times in the first three chapters. After chapter 4, it was never mentioned ever again until the end of the book. Why? I believe that was the rapture. The church was taken into heaven. And so... It says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 1 to 9, Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know every well, very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. So if it says it comes like a thief in the night, you'll never have time enough to prepare. And that's why it's important, as we had sang uh, this morning, we need to get ready. Amen? So these are the powerful words in the Scripture. Prepare for the end of time. In verses 1 to 3 of 1 Thessalonians, uh, it says, <coughs> sorry, of chapter 5, concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. Why, is he, why do you think he said that? Because he had actually, Paul had actually prepared the Thessalonians for the coming of the Lord. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. When they say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Now, when everybody was saying peace and safety, then the suddenness would come. While people are so feeling that security, then things are going to happen very, very fast. But, the, but Paul says, but you are not in darkness, so that this day should not overtake you as a thief. You know, he was saying, but you are supposed to be aware. 
you're not in darkness. You absolutely know what's going to happen. That's why we're having this three-week teaching. So that it will not overtake you as a thief. <clears throat> so, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath. Okay, now I'll take that scripture. Again, I would say that's a proof that we will not go through the tribulation. That when you read... <coughs> An easy reading of, of the book of Revelation. The seals were opened, and then the, the trumpets were blown, and then the bowls were poured out. <coughs> it is all very horrible, horrible times. <coughs> okay, so God did not appoint us for wrath, so I believe we will escape the tribulation. Okay, let me explain that later on. The third. <coughs> event is the tribulation the whole chapters of chapter 6 to 19 is the tribulation now if you're not going to go to the rapture i suggest you do a verse by verse study of this verse these verses because this is exactly what's going to take place after the rapture it's a seven year period will literally where the wrath of god is poured out now Sometimes, you know, the first, the Antichrist is revealed, and once the Antichrist uh, is ever revealed, you know, uh, people have made a lot of speculations that he will be a politician, not a religious leader, but a very famous person who literally broker a peace between the Middle East for the first time. Now, I think we're almost right there, you know, and uh, you read the book of uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, it talks about the kings of the north, the kings of the south, the kings of the east and the kings of the, of the west. The kings of the north is Gog and Magog and Rosh, which is uh, the uh, literal uh, uh, root word for the word Russia. And you go to the south, it's all the Middle Eastern countries. You go to the west, it's all America and Europe. And you go to the east, it's China. Now, if you look at the whole you know, political spectrum right now, everything is revolving around the Middle East. And uh, with Israel right now, you know, you just recently know that the ICC has declared a rest warrant for Netanyahu and uh, the, you know, the defense secretary of Israel, of IDF. And uh, the, the, the implication is if all the countries would join for the first time in the history of Israel, Israel will be totally isolated. Now, that seems to be a preparation. I'm gonna, you're going to see why. It's going to happen because something is going to happen at the end of the tribulation. In Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse verse seven: For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. Now, this is this verse tells me that the Antichrist hasn't come up yet. Why? Because of this verse: For the one who holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. Who holds back the evil and the lawlessness in the world? It's the Holy Spirit. And it says here, it implies here, the one who holds it back will continue to do so until he's taken out of the way. So the one, the Holy Spirit, there will come a time when the Holy Spirit will be taken out of the earth. And then there will be continuous lawlessness and things will really go crazy. Now, where is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is in us, right? So that's why I believe we're going to be taken away. Because if we are taken away with the Holy Spirit then uh, the lawlessness and the Antichrist will, be continue, will be, uh, finally have the freedom to be revealed. So that's, to me, another proof that we will, join, we will not go through the tribulation. <clears throat> now, I think if you would have time when you get home, read chapter 6 up to chapter 19. Everybody has a Bible. You can have a simpler version that you can read, but read those chapters and you'll find out how graphic, uh, sometimes metaphoric, is the, the terms that are used. They have eagles and dragons, you know, and beasts. But it is all described there. But some of the words, now I want you to imagine this. This is John. John lived 2,000 years ago. No nuclear weapons, only uh, swords and arrows and shields. So he has no idea what he is looking at. 
He says, huge, gigantic locusts could actually mean helicopters. There are many portions that when you read it, with the mind of a 2,000, 2000 years ago, you would not understand it. You have no concept of nuclear explosions and things that are happening. But if you read it today, wow, that seems like it's, it's real. And so I want you to take that and read it because the technology at that time is different. And uh, there's no such thing as a nuclear bomb. But that was prophesied 2,000 years ago. So I think it's so important for us to understand that the only thing that we have today that can really guide us in the future is the Bible. You know, I don't know what the culture says. I don't know what the opinions of other people say. I think what is important is if the Bible says it, we have to believe it. Amen? I think it's important to say that because the seven-year tribulation is going to be the hardest, most dangerous time to live on the face of the earth. Now, I'll not read to you the details of the seven seals, of the, of the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls that were poured out. But if you go read it, you can understand what the Lord is trying to say. It brings me to the fourth event in the book of Revelation. Revelation 19 and 20 is the second coming of Christ. Jesus comes and he arrives in a majestic display of power and amazing display of the whole uh, entourage of the angels of the Lord. Now, this literally happens at the battle of Armageddon or the valley of Jehoshaphat. Now, I, just, I can only say at this point that that battle is where all the nations of the earth will come and gather and unite to destroy the one nation in the Middle East, which is Israel. And when that happens, you know it's already the battle of Armageddon. And uh, this is what everybody quotes, you know, or kind of relates as, oh, this is the end times. That's the apocalypse because it's all the destruction of everything in the world. But really, this is the second coming of Christ. Now, listen to how majestic it is. Revelations 19, 11 to 16. Then I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes were like blazing fire. On his head were many crowns, and his name was written on him that no one knows but him, he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. That's the, the, the death of the Lord, the blood that was, that was, uh, resurrect, uh, that was crucified uh, out of his crucifixion. And his name is the Word of God. Now the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword, which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap offering because that is the triumphant final entry of Jesus back on earth. He is going to step down on Mount of Olives and accomplish the next uh, exactly the next event that's going to take place, right? <clears throat> now, what I did not mention here, why before this happens, something is going to happen in the heavens. And this is going to happen because the church is raptured into the heavens, which is the fifth event described in Revelation chapter 19. That's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Marriage supper of the Lamb is a feast of the church and Jesus. It's really like a wedding reception. Like I said last week, when we get to heaven, it's not that, oh, it will be announced, but, oh, Satan is defeated. We're not going to shout hallelujah. The very first thing we we're going to do when we get to heaven is we're going to eat. Amen. We love eating. Eating is the best uh, time to have together. But exactly the first thing we're going to do now, you have a lot of uh, uh, wrong concepts about going to heaven. You're not going to eat. You're, you, you will just be like a, a baby with a harp on a, sitting on a cloud and just playing the harp the whole day long. That's, that will be boring, right? You know, but I can tell you it will not be boring when we get to heaven. First thing we do is we eat. Let me, let me read it. I heard what sounded like a great multitude, 
like the roar of rushing waters, like loud peals of thunder shouting. Now, can you imagine if you are in a stadium of 100,000 people and you heard people screaming and you could, you could almost hear it's like peals of thunder. And this is the description that John says. He's never seen so much people in his whole life. He's, he lived 2,000 years ago. Then he looks at it and says, it's like the sound of roaring, rushing waters, and loud peals of thunder, shouting hallelujah for the Lord Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride had made himself ready. We we're singing about that this morning. Fine linen, bright and clean was given to wear. So what are those wearing, what are those white clothes? Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Every time you do something right, you, you, you put on yourself a garment of white. Every time you accomplish God's destiny for your life, you're, wearing, you're going to be wearing fine linen. That's the dress code, which is the righteous acts of God's people on the marriage supper, on the wedding reception with the Lord. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. He added, these are the word, true words of God. Now, <clears throat> I invite you to another world. I invite you to, we talk about multiverse, another universe where the scripture describes exactly what's going to happen at the end of the ages. And this is part of it. It will be a massive wedding reception of the body of Christ. And there will be a, rep we will be, re you know, I, I believe uh, all kinds of food would represent them. So, I mean, you'll have adobo, you'll have sinigang, you'll have pizza. I, I believe there will be every sort of dish. Why? Because every tribe and tongue and nation in the world will be represented. Every person on the face of the earth will be represented, will be there. Every ethnic group will be there. Brings me to the sixth event, which is the great white throne. Great white throne found in Revelation chapter 20. You know why it's called the great white throne? Because it says, then I saw a great white throne. <laughs> you know, that's what it's called. That's, that's, what, that's the theological term that they said, great white throne, because that's what John saw. And him who sat on it, those and th whose, th whose face the earth had, and the heaven fled away, and there was no more place for them. Now think about that. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. The books were open. Now, uh, I want to refer to that plural books. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead will be judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Okay? So it's so interesting. Every person alive on the earth, starting Adam and Eve, all the way to the most recent person who died, will be at the great white throne judgment. And that would be billions of people that ever existed, you know. And so, <clears throat> it's like God is formalizing a court hearing here. So, when he formalizes it, it's very important. There are two kinds of books that are open. One is a set of books or a set of files. And another one is just one book. And everyone, the first is a set of books, and every single thing that you said, you thought of, and everything that you did is recorded in the books. There's no escape. Every single thing is recorded. I mean, when you talk about internet and you talk about the cloud, I think that's the real cloud. <laughs> everything is stored in that real cloud over there, right? And so everything that you've ever done in your whole life is recorded there. Everything that you've ever thought, everything that you've ever spoken is recorded in that book. Now, you're either, you will have a choice. You're either going to be judged by the books or you're going to be judged by the book, singular. Now, the book is different. It just, it's just a list of names. It's like a directory, a list of names of all those who gave their lives to Jesus Christ and they became believers. And if you gave your life to the Lord, your name is going to be in that book. Absolutely. That's what, this, that's what the Bible says. And it's going to come to a point wherein if you, your name is written in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life, you will, can never be judged by the books. You can only be judged by the book of life. What does that mean? It means 
I have given my life to the Lord Jesus Christ and He paid the price for everything that I have done that is recorded in the books. Everything that I've done that is recorded, everything I've said, every bad word I've spoken, every th wrong thought that I've, I thought of that was written in the books, all of that will be paid for if you are in the Lamb's book of life. Amen? And every believer will not have to go through the, sec through the great white throne judgment because you have been judged by the book of life. Amen? So that's going to be awesome. So just extend your imagination, which is the last event, the new heaven and the new earth. And I saw a new heaven and new earth, verse 1, 21, Revelation. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. Now think about that. And then you go on later on, you read it, and it says that there, the sun will go on, will go dark, there will be no more sun, no more stars, and then it says that God himself will be the source of light. And then he will be with his people. I, I've, I've uh, done a very good study on this, and it just is amazing. All the things that were set in the book of Genesis, how earth was, will be exactly as it was in the last two chapters of Revelation. Earth will be restored in its Eden Genesis setting and form. It does not need any rain. In, in the Garden of Eden, there was no rain. There was no storm. There was no typhoon. There's no drought. You know, there's no, there's no earthquake. There's no diabetes. There's no, there's no cancer. There's nothing of that in the old order. Everything is going to be set back in, into its perfect form. Hallelujah. And every person who is a child of God will be part of the new heaven and new earth. See, I, I look at that and I say, <clears throat> uh, praise the Lord, wala nang traffic sa EDSA. <laughs> praise the Lord, everything, no more insurance, nothing. Everything will be totally new. And I just want you to imagine that because that's, you know, for us, that's very hard to imagine, you know. And uh, I, 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 like, you know, I like to watch uh, sci-fi movies, you know, futuristic movies. But when I was reading it, I mean, this is the real amazing picture of really what's going to happen. This is, this is not fiction, right? This is real. This is what the Bible says. Perfect order. And you're going to enjoy rivers and mountains. You're going to enjoy uh, all the things that you know that, you know, if I have to travel to Switzerland just to see all the mountains and the wonderful things, that will not happen because in a new heaven and new earth, you will enjoy all of God's creation as it is. And that's the amazing thing, you know. And, uh, and then we're going to be one big family, you know. And uh, some people told me that, oh, if, if this, this group of people are, are going to be there, I won't be there. Well, you won't be there <laughs> if you don't love people. Because every person, as one person said, all the Chinese people, they will look like people from, from America. That's not true. We will not all look alike. We will keep our ethnicity. We will keep the way we look. And we will glorify God with the who we are. And everyone will be represented. One person told me, God must love the Chinese. I said, why? Because he created too many of them. You know? <clears throat> when it comes to Norwegians, they're just in one little corner, maybe 200, 200 people, but then billions of Chinese. Now think about that. How many of you know God loves all the nations, right? And he is going to have his inheritance on all the nations. And that's going to happen on the new heaven and new earth. Now, now here's one, one thing that if, if, you, if you look at this, <clears throat> I just want you to look at uh, something that's very important. I think all of this, I look at the book of Revelation in a different light today. If you have a wedding planner, if somebody's getting married, right? You have a wedding planner who takes care of everything, prepares everything. The book of Revelation is God's wedding planner for the church. Is trying to let you know what's going to happen. It's, it is not to scare us. It is to make us understand, oh, I am so excited. I'm excited. I'm preparing myself as a groom. I prepared the place for you, and I want you to be ready. How much do we spend for a wedding? How much time do we prepare for a wedding? How, you know, we have to prepare the bride, you know. Kailang mag-fasting, mag-diet, right? Those who are getting married, they have to... Uh, slim down so that they could they could be in a you know 
better uh, fit the dress. Everything's prepared just for the groom. And I think the Lord is saying, I'm giving a whole book. Listen, this is what's going to happen. Get ready. He says in verse 19, uh, chapter 19, verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His wife had made Himself ready. For her, it, to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. What a statement. Now, I want you to look uh, the, at the screen for tree charts. That's what just, we just went through in 15 minutes. So, you can see, final church, the rapture of the church, right? When we get raptured to the church, we're going to have either seven years in heaven with the Lord. While we're having that seven years, we'll have the marriage supper of the Lamb. But during this rapture, there's the judgment seat of Christ. What happens at the judgment seat of Christ? Uh, Jesus gives rewards and takes away rewards. You know, he's not just a punisher of, of sin. He's a rewarder of righteous acts. The rewards will be given at judgment seat of Christ. And then the great white throne judgment happens towards the end. After the second coming of Jesus, this is where the battle of Armageddon happens. There's going to be a 1,000 year reign of Christ on earth. Now, in 1,000 years, Jesus is going to come and rule earth. So, Lord, what are we going to do when you're ruling earth? Uh, I don't know. We're just going to wait around. I'm going to read to you exactly what we're going to do. And uh, I, like I said, you know, come to another universe. This is exactly what God describes is going to happen. But at the end of that 1,000 years, Satan will be bound at the end of the 1,000 years Satan will be released for a moment, and then Jesus is going to come and totally destroy all of Satan and all of the demons and throw them into the lake of fire. Where is Satan during the 1,000 years? He will be bound, not yet in the lake of fire. The lake of fire happens at the great white throne. So I just want you to, you know, there's a lot of verses involved, and you can actually do a whole semester teaching all of this. But I'm just trying to give you a summary of what happens, right? The battle of Armageddon, again, happens at the second coming of Christ. But there will be another battle at the great, before the great white throne when Satan is thrown to the lake of fire. Okay? Malino ba? Now that's as clear as I can put it. The whole book of Revelation. Now, here's the controversy. Some people don't believe that we will be raptured here. This seven-year tribulation is seven years, three and a half years. is going to be a time of prosperity. Another three and a half years is going to be time of all the bowls and, and the trumpets and all that pouring. And some, some Christian says that the rapture is going to happen in the middle. Let me show the second chart. So the rapture happens in the middle of the tribulation after three and a half years. So instead of seven, seven, spending seven years in the, in the heavens, then we're going to spend three and a half years. Now, there's another uh, belief among the Christians that we will all go through the tribulation until the very end. So then at that, the third chart is that the rapture happens and we spend five minutes in heaven and Jesus comes down together with us. You know? So it's just like a coffee break in heaven. <laughs> <clears throat> now, I don't know what you believe in, but I have no proof of this. Go to the second, balik tayo to the second. I have very little proof of this, but on the first, that's exactly what I feel. This has more proof on this, that we are all going to be raptured before the tribulation. Amen? I think that deserves a clap offering, you know. I think we believe that God's going to... Why? Because we are not appointed for wrath. God is not appointed us for wrath. And in descriptions, uh, last three and a half years of Revelation... Is God is going to pour out the fury of His wrath on earth. Now, uh, again, I, I, if you just read it for yourself, it's so, so hard to just, you know, uh, get all the words. Because it, it says that uh, uh, one-fourth of the earth will be dead. The sea is going to turn red. There's going to be a, you know, locust is going to come. It's just, this is scary things, you know, scary things. Okay. 
Let me end this with this parable in Luke chapter 19, verse 11. Understanding the second coming of the Lord. How do we get ready? <clears throat> and here's the parable that Jesus says. It's literally a description of the second coming. It, sounds, sounds, it seems to be more of a, <clears throat> a metaphor, a <clears throat> comparison of the second coming. While they were listening to these things, the disciples, Jesus went to tell them a parable because he was nearing Jerusalem and they supposed that the kingdom of God will, was going to be, appear immediately. So two reasons why he tells the parable, because they're coming to Jerusalem, Jesus is going to be crucified in Jerusalem, and number two, they believe that the kingdom is coming already. So Jesus has to tell this parable, okay? So in the parable, it says in verse 12, a nobleman, listen carefully, Nobleman went to a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then return. Now, definitely that nobleman refers to Jesus. He leaves and then he is going to come back, right? The phrase to return, verse 13. And then he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minus and said to them, do business with this until I come back, right? Servants is referred to as believers, right? Believers, servants. Minus is one mina is two and a half years salary. Now think about that. <clears throat> Your salary is ten thousand a month. One year is one hundred twenty thousand. Two years is two hundred forty thousand. Two and a half years is, you know, alam niyo <laughs> And then he gave it to each and every one. Two and a half years salary, and he says, "Do business, do the work until I come." But then there's an extra, uh, that's an insert in verse 14. But the citizens hated him, the nobleman, and sent a delegation after him saying, we do not want this man to reign over us. The citizens referred to here are the non-believers. And then again, it was their choice not to believe. Verse 15. And so it was then, uh, it was, so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded the servants to me have given the money to be called to him and he might know how much each every man had gained by trading. Verse 16, 17, then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned 10 minas. And then he said to him, well done, good and servant, because you were faithful in a very little. Listen, I give you authority over 10 cities. Now he is definitely referring to the 1,000 year reign. 10 cities, notice in the next life we will have responsibilities. <clears throat> Verse 18 and 19, and the second came saying, Master, your mine has earned five minus. Likewise, he said, you also be over five cities. Then another came saying, Master, here is your mine. I've kept put away in a handkerchief. <clears throat> so I, so for I feared because you are <clears throat> an austere man and you collect what you did not deposit, reap with those you did not sow. And he said, out of your mouth, own mouth, I will judge you, you wicked servant. You knew that I was an austere man, collecting what I did not deposit, reaping what I did not sow. Why then did you not put my money in the bank, that at my coming I might have collected it with interest? And he said to those who stood by, take the mina from him and give it to the one who has ten minas. What's the moral of that story? You know, it's not when the Lord, before he returns, he will not reward laziness. He will not reward persons who will not work. He will make sure that all those who serve Him will be completely rewarded. Now, I don't know if you remember, I discussed this four years ago when I talked about the second coming. But I had not completely related it to all the things that are happening in the book of Revelation. In verse 25 and 26, But they said to Him, Master, He has ten minus, the one who is given another ten minus. For I say that to everyone who has will be given, and to him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. God will not honor those who do not work for the kingdom. If you work for the kingdom, I, I know. How do you do that? You know, some people say, well, I, I, I'm just, you know, serving as an usher. Don't belittle your service. I just give my tithes. I, I contributed to the mission. I tried to do my best to serve. I, I volunteer. I work. I share the gospel. Don't belittle what you're doing because God has an accountant in heaven and he counts whatever you does and when he comes back the first thing he would say what have you done with all the gifts that I have given you so 
in verse 27, but bring here those enemies of mine, the citizens, the unbelievers, who did not want me to reign over them and slay them before me. <clears throat> okay, that's a summary of the millennial reign, if you think about it. And I want you to understand very carefully right now, because next week we'll talk about when is he coming. It's going to be very interesting. You know, he can come tonight. He can come tonight. I don't think, if he comes tonight, then we will not have to preach next Sunday. <laughs> he can come tonight because that's his prerogative. I say he is not coming tonight because we haven't seen, as of the moment, the, uh, the, the setup. You know, the Holy Spirit is still here. It's not been taken away. So I can say that. But I can tell you this. He can make a decision, and I will, I'm going to come tonight. I think, you know, the Lord is saying, Jesus is saying to the Heavenly Father, I think I'm so excited. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. And you know what happens? The Heavenly Father holds his hand. No, 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 not yet. I still need, I need, still need this brother to repent. I'm still waiting for this person to become a Christian. So it's most, I think, for, for the part in heaven, it's the Heavenly Father who restrains Jesus. And he sets the times and seasons, but Jesus is so excited to come. He is so excited. He wrote the book of Revelation just to let us know the excitement that's being built inside his spirit. You know. But he says, do business till I come. Okay? Now, it doesn't mean we all become Chinese businessmen. You know? It doesn't mean we all invest. Okay? <laughs> what did Jesus say when he was 12 years old to the scribes and the Pharisees at the temple? I'm about in my father's business. Now think about that. What is the business that Jesus left? Go into all the world, preach the gospel. That's evangelism, witnessing, and making disciples. Are you witnessing, sharing the gospel? Are you making disciples? Are you doing your business with the Lord? Oh, I've done it before. I don't think I can do it again. I give up. Now listen, brothers and sisters, as long as you breathe on earth, as long as you have breath, you have something to do for God. You cannot say, Lord, I've done it already before. That's it. Now listen, brothers and sisters, that's not right. Do business until I'm tired. Do ministry until I've done what I think is right. The Lord says, do business until I come. Until he comes. You know? So that's why Abel and I, we're not going to retire. When we reach the age of 80, we're going to plant a church. A better church than Jesus thought. <laughs> Maybe. Right? So, that's one. Number two is giving. You know, part of the work that you do is giving. Now, not just giving finances. It's giving your gifts, your talents. Number three is serve. Now, how do you serve? Is serve in the body of Christ. Last week, I discussed why it's important to be a part of the church. The second coming, the, the, the warning that Jesus says, do not despise the gathering of believers or the assembly of the believers is in the context of the second coming. We serve together. We work together. We live our lives together. Now, I know it's not perfect. And sometimes, you know, you get offended with somebody. Sometimes, you know, I, I don't like to work with other guys. That's fine. Go find somebody else. But you cannot avoid being part of the church. Because that's where Jesus, where Jesus is going to come for. And finally, I would like to just qualify everything I said. Make a difference wherever you are, whatever you do. Make a difference. Matthew 5, 13 says, You are the salt of the earth. You're the light of the world. What's the difference between salt and light? Salt of the earth salt of the earth the place where you live light of the world the world is the is the order of the people in the world the culture you have to be both salt and light and then god can come amen do business till i come or occupy till i come amen could we give the lord a clap offering I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes. We're going to call Pastor Paul and Pastor Ziggy on stage. I want them to be part of this closing of this message.
And I'm going to be asking a very simple question. And they're going to come and pray. Are you running away from God? Or somehow, Lord, I've not been so up with my devotions. I've not really focused on you the last few months and years. I've been so distracted. But I want to, I want to be ready for your coming. We can be ready. We can. We can be ready. It's possible to be ready for tonight if He decides to come tonight. It's possible to be ready if He decides that I don't finish this message this morning and then it comes. All you need to do is come to Him and ask for forgiveness for all your sins and give your life to Him. So I'm going to be asking you to think about that. And then I'm going to be asking, Lord, how do I serve you? Lord, I'm sick. I have all these problems. This, this. We're going to pray for your needs. And then we're going to pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So think about it. Are you ready? And I'm going to ask Pastor Paul to just lead us in that prayer right now. Can I ask all of us this is to just highlight Maybe if you want to come back to the Lord, if you haven't really made this prayer, but can we just pray this all together as a church family? Just repeat after me. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins and surrender my life. Wash me clean. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He died on the cross for my sins rose again on the third day so that I could live a victorious life I confess with my mouth that Jesus is my Savior and Jesus is my Lord I'm going to ask Pastor Sigi to just pray for the Holy Spirit and those who need healing the same God who did miracles in the past the same God who healed many sick people in the past is still the same God that we have today that you can release healing power upon us Lord to those who are sick to those who need healing Father God in our family and may your hands be upon them Lord we believe in the power of the resurrection of Jesus from the cross that not only saved us but also he healed us oh God and we receive that right now by faith we are healed by your blood by your wounds we are healed already physically even emotionally even spiritually Lord God we receive your power God and it will manifest in our body oh Lord God that you will touch us Father God and release us from all of our sickness Lord and we receive your miracle today in the name of Jesus and also Lord we open our hearts before you we will not resist the Holy Spirit but today we receive the power of the Holy Spirit come rest on us Holy Spirit you are not a thing to be used you are someone that we can know you are someone that we can believe in Lord and so Holy Spirit we welcome you in our hearts move in your mighty power fill us with your mighty rushing wind fill us with your mighty fire Lord God that you will increase in our in our spirit Lord God and we will walk Father God freely because we have the Holy Spirit empowering us today and all the days of our lives and we receive it right now in the name of Jesus and let's give the Lord a clap offering I want you to stand I want us to sing a glory song something that we believe God because today is just we just you know went through the book of Revelation a powerful powerful book that I believe is so important for our Christian life and let's just celebrate God's goodness in our midst amen